All right. Hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Anthony. And as you already know, you are here at the Search Engine Workshop. So this workshop is going to be pretty broad in what it's covering. We're going to have some example code at the end, some short Python code. Uh, it's OK if you don't know Python. We're going to try to walk you through the code. And I'm more than happy to help you with the Discord after this workshop's over. So this is a really broad introduction to search engines, what search engines are. Let me actually go uh, what search engines are, what they, the challenges with designing search engines, the ethical concerns with search engines, how AI is related to them, uh, some other things, the cool things about search engines, some fun facts, and a little bit of history of search engines in general. A very brief history, like two slides. So don't worry, it's not a history class. So a little bit about me. Uh, I'm a senior UCF. CS major, that came off wrong. Uh, <laughs> I've been studying here at UCF since 2018. I'm originally from Miami-Dade College. Um, I'm an incoming software engineer at Microsoft, not on the Bing team. I interned with Microsoft this past summer. I absolutely loved it there, and I went ahead and just accepted the offer. I didn't even bother <laughs> applying to other places for my senior graduation round. Um, if you like this talk and want to follow me on Twitter, I'm going to give a shameless plug. Uh, I love I love Twitter a lot, so I know a lot of people have very contentious opinions on it, but I find it a really fun place, especially if you're into AI or you're into specific niches of tech. Keeping up with those people in tech is a great way to keep up with the news in that area. So, and uh, here at UCF, I do research in evolutionary computation. I don't actually don't even do anything with search engines. I just like search engines. So, like the slide says, I'm not even going to work for Bing or Google. So, um, but let, let's jump right into it. I kind of mentioned the learning outcomes earlier. So hopefully by the end of this talk, you, you look at search engines that's not as this thing you use in your everyday life, because what, I use search engines uh, to even make this talk. Thank you, Christopher, the comment. For anybody, don't worry, I know Christopher. So that comment is uh, not inappropriate. We are friends. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, just so the learning outcomes, hopefully you come back, you come back to this, you're like, you look at Google and you're like, oh my God, no wonder they have an entire company and the main product is dedicated to search. Uh, it is not an easy challenge. As you'll see here, a lot of information is going to be thrown at you. So don't worry if you lose yourself along the way. If something doesn't make sense, that's perfectly OK. Please ask questions during the specified question breaks. And please, you know, if you want to ask more questions after this workshop, go ahead and contact me, especially if you're watching a recording of this workshop. Um, I'm going to be on the Night Hacks Discord even after the hackathon is over. So, so we're going to start with the definition for search engines. We're going to come up with a definition at least. So this is not completely comprehensive, but I think this will work for the context of how we're using search engines on web data. So search engines, three main things. They have web crawlers, so they have little programs and scripts that go across the web. Excuse me that surf the web, we can say. We can use data terminology. And they go ahead and they extract data from those websites. Then they have a database. It's often called an index when you're talking about search engines that stores the data in there. And then the last thing, it's a search bar. Um, I'm going to have a few slides of a bunch of specialized search engines afterwards. And you're going to see that it's all search bar. It's all this basic, just an empty bar, a logo on top, and a button to search something. That's all it is. So. Before we kind of move forward, like I said, this talk is going to be fairly interactive. So I really want some chatty audience that's more than I have fine this time around. Um, but please, the question on the slide, before I go, what are some assumptions people have about search? Um, give your best guess. So when you look at a search engine, what are some things you just automatically assume it does? What are some of the things you assume that it knows either from your own experience, or your own observations? If you don't have an answer, that's perfectly OK. We'll move past this slide eventually. That's a good one. Acts like an encyclopedia. Yep, it looks through website web pages for certain words and sorts them by popularity. So everything's online. And another great one that even if I don't spell word, I, I, I'm, I can't read that comment. I'm so sorry, Dylan. I'm messing up on reading right here. And I made a whole slide. So we're going to start with some falsehoods about search. So one of the big ones is that people know what they're looking for. Uh, they often don't. So search engines, ideally through good user, user interface and good user experience, they help direct people that know what they're looking for. You know, sometimes people do know what they're looking for. But if you knew what you're looking for, you wouldn't really search in the first place. You would go directly to the thing you're trying to find. Um, 
that people notice their own misspellings. Sometimes they don't. Um, maintaining a list of all misspellings, I don't even know if I can get into why, why that might be so difficult. Um, my last name is often autocorrected on every single piece of software. And I know many of you who might have difficult to spell last names or on common last names often appear, get that problem too, which goes to the next one, customers want their misspellings corrected. If I look up my name on the search engine, I don't want Google to correct my last name. Um, the, the big next one is a big security risk. Uh, never, this goes for any piece of software. If you have a little form that a user enters something in, never pass that directly to your API or database. You need to do some cleaning beforehand. Um, and one that search will work the same way forever. Uh, if that was true, we wouldn't have this amazing evolving landscape of search engines. So the first is search engine that kind of used all the three ingredients that we mentioned before was this search engine from April of 1994 called Webcrawler. Uh, it was made by some folks at the University of Washington, and it combined a web crawler, like we mentioned, an index, and a search page. Uh, I believe this specific icon uh, screenshot is from 1996, but search engines, despite that we'll see that research on search engines has been a long time coming, um, they actually haven't been around that long. So you think only about 30, coming up on 30 years now, they're still a fairly recent thing. So. The big case study we're going to be using is Google. So Google is a search engine that originated from Stanford, and Stanford actually has a lot of like Yahoo came from Stanford. Another big search engine from the late 90s, early 2000s also came from Stanford. So Stanford has a pretty big role in the history of search. And so this was, I think, a 1997 demo of Google, this screenshot right here. Um, it's from the Computer History Museum. If anybody's curious, it's a really cool website. So. Fun UI, you can even see that even modern day Google has not derivated much from this UI. So let's go on to the next question. We're gonna start jumping into the more meaty technical bits of everything. That was your history. Um, how do you think a search engine searches? So someone gave a little hint at it earlier, like it looks through web pages for certain words, but how can we expand on that? So if I type in a query for a search engine, what do you think happens behind the scenes? Yep. So these are some good answers. So one is search for keywords, and you're going to see that that's really close to the right answer. The other one is we look through a ranked database and display the best results according to what the user searched. Um, and then another one, popularity, most recent, how many people have visited the site before? All of these are really correct answers, and we're going to see that search engines are kind of a mix of everything here. So one thing, so when we go to search for something, before we even begin, how do we efficiently search for something. So the example, the meta example I included here is, how are you so fast, Google? It looked over 3 billion results. I hope that's 3 billion, but that number there is 2 billion, uh, in under a second. That is an insane amount. And you think, if I have this big book and I'm trying to find things to search through, I'm not going to look through every page like, OK, I got on this page. I'm going to look through every single word. That wouldn't be efficient if I went through each and every page. OK, this page has the word Python in it, page 220. OK, then we're going to return that to the user. That's just not an efficient process for looking up information. Um, so how do search engines overcome this problem? And you're going to get the answer I'm going to tell you. <laughs> we use something that's called an inverted index. And don't worry if you're still really new into the computer science or if you're other folks here who are coming from different non-technical, non-CS backgrounds. Um, I'm going to kind of explain everything right here. So this is a little bit technical for those newer folks. But we use what's called an inverted index. An inverted index is rather than take all the words on the page, and then let's see, I'm going to search page 232, and I'm going to go through each and every single word. What they do is they use something called a hash table. And all you need to know for hash table for now, it's this very nice diagram and these photos that I included. So if I have a sentence that says, the cow says moo, then every single word in the sentence, I'm going to map it on the left, which is the key. And then the value of that key is going to be what the documents say. So another way I could explain that 
is I'm trying to find my own keys, but I don't have my keys on me. I, that analogy is no longer going to work. But <laughs> so another way we can look at that is actually the index for a book. So this was, if we go to the index for the book, let me see, I go to B, I go in the dictionary, I go to B, you can't really see what the book says. Um, but let's see, it says buffer protocol right here. And buffer protocols on page 348. I imagine a lot of people don't actually use indexes, but if you pick up your nearest textbook, I'm sure it will have an index for you to sift through and search through. So um, I'm, you can imagine that if you have an inverted index, as it's called, which is a fancy name for something that isn't too fancy, um, that this will be ginormous for something like Google. And it is. Um, there's no way really around this. If you want to search the entire web, you need to maintain a giant database slash index. Um, so oftentimes, they'll use things like compression or other memory techniques to reduce the size of this database. And that's something that you can delve further into with some of the resources I share at the end of the slides. So um, now that we kind of know what are search engines and how do we efficiently search for things, we use what's called an inverted index, which is just like the index at the back of your textbook. How can we now further improve search? So a lot of you are already given great answers, um, some of the answers to the earlier questions. But how, if I'm going to search for the age of a celebrity on Google, how can Google make that search better for me and easier for me as a user? I also pause these questions as quick water breaks. Yep, these are great answers. So one of them is make it pop up before even entering a website. Yep, that's and you're going to see that's exactly what Google does. Or using your prior search history, also exactly what search engines do. So yep, improving the search experience. So there's a lot of ways we can improve the search experiences. Ranking the results, personalizing the results, using past search history to enter your location, um, spelling corrections, yes or no. We don't always want to correct spell misspells. Sometimes that's very intentional. Um, keeping up to date with the news. So if I searched COVID-19 a year ago, nothing would have popped up. That would have been just a random word I looked up. But if I look up COVID-19 now, you know, if someone's looking that up, they want to keep up to date with the news regarding the coronavirus. So, and you can do other things like interpreting meaning in sentences. So these two sentences will return the same result if you fill in like whale shark or something. Um, they'll return the same result in Google. So these are other ways you can improve the search experience and also improve it on your end as an engineer is we'll see using AI to help find cinnamon synonyms and help find common words. So you can use two sentences to mean the same thing. And English is a really messy language. So this problem is particularly hard in English. So Here's some actual UI UX examples of improving the search experience. So if you look up Mothman, you'll get this really, this is from Bing. So this one's from Bing, these two are from Google. Um, but if you look up Mothman, you get this really nice info panel as they're often called, that gives me the quick summary of Mothman and then a direct link to Wikipedia so I can learn more. Uh, if I wanted to know long how whale sharks live, then boom, I get the answer right there. And then if I this Google Halo Infinite, uh, I get a really fun one. Will Halo be infinite? So these are other ways that you can use to narrow down the search for users. If they didn't find what they're looking for, they can do people also ask. Um, and I think some insider info, I don't think this people also ask question is like actual other queries. I think this is kind of auto-generated with a mix of AI and also other people in user search history. So that's kind of a lie. It's AI also ask. Let's go through it. So speaking of AI, how does AI help us improve search? So there's a really cool deep dive into the history of search that I'm going to link at the end of all of this. But it talks about how AI and search are like intertwined. Uh, and a lot of early search engines and also researchers in search were also AI researchers. And they wanted to know, how can I map a natural language sentence? How can I map that to structured data in a database? So mapping queries to knowledge in a database, exactly what I just said. Uh, natural language processing, NLP, is the field of AI applied to language in not just English, but any language in general. So giving relevant results, like so many of you have said before, offering alternative search queries, like I did with the people also ask section, and displaying relevant info panels. You may think all of this is just hard coded from an engineer, 
but actually it's really sophisticated AI working behind the scenes to make sure it gives you the right, right info panels and the right results. So not only did a web crawler have to get this information from Science Mag, it had to know how to interpret that. So how can we map this English sentence to that English answer? And not to, this also happens in other languages too. So not just English. So this kind of leads into the next big thing about search and the next big algorithm we're gonna talk about is how should we rank search results? So if, if we have the entire internet at our fingertips, if I wanna search something, how should we rank them? And I've given some hints and you have all given some really relevant answers already. So. So someone in the chat typed uh, popularity, and I'm not saying your name in case you don't want your name to appear in the recording, so I'm trying to avoid using people's names. Um, but someone in the chat wrote popularity. What does that mean? What does popularity mean in this instance? Most clicks. Most clicks is a really good answer. And you'll see that's not the answer that we're going to use, but I really like that. And I'm actually curious. Commonly searched keywords. So yep, how many? So another answer we should rank by displaying some results to the user and ranking based on how many times a document is clicked across sessions. So that's another good answer. Uh, unfortunately, the answer is not most clicks. Um, it's page rank. So the page rank is not just the only way to rank search results. It's Google's most. It's the most famous one because Google pioneered it. Um, but the idea of ranking weighed results goes back as far as like 1974 and like the first publication was in 1977. Um, so another, another answer just came in percent match, but kind of the early ways that pages were ranked and how important pages were, well, how many times pages were linked to each other? So in the early days of the web, it was not as big and as disconnected as it was now, uh, but pages often referenced each other because back then before search engines, it was hard to find someone else's page. So you often had the habit of linking to other people's pages and linking back to other people's pages. So you can think of this B like Wikipedia and all of these sites link back to Wikipedia. Um, and if you're interested in diving deeper, this is often called a Markov chain or it's like a variant of a Markov chain. So, and I actually gave a workshop about Markov chains from Night Hacks. It's on their YouTube channel. So if you wanna go ahead and watch that and learn about Markov chains, I highly encourage you to do so. Um, but yeah, Google's PageRank algorithm and the, the kind of the algorithm a lot of early ranking uh, algorithms use, algorithm all of, a lot of times, so, uh, is the value of a website is proportional to how many other websites link to it. So that's how important a website is. They didn't really keep track of user clicks back then. Definitely modern day advances do, do keep track of user clicks uh, and they do keep track of relevance to the query. But speaking of modern answers, uh, modern answers often use really powerful AI techniques and models. So Google, had, like October of last year, Google started using BERT, which was a big machine learning model that they made for natural language. If I think BERT stands for bi-directional something uh, encoding a transformer. I don't actually remember what the ER stands for. If someone can chime in in the chat and let us know. But the, Google used BERT, the really powerful AI, and we could see before and after BERT was implemented in their search results. So using better understanding natural language can give us better results than regular hard coding and some classical computer science algorithms can. So it just further shows how AI is so entrenched in our modern day lives and all the critical parts in place, like to things you use every day. So we talked about how to implement all these things, or at least a rough part, and we're gonna go deeper into implementation details towards the end of the talk, and then we're gonna dive into some code. But how do you use, like, there's a bunch of engineering challenges associated with search, and I told you at the beginning of the talk that search is probably one of the hardest uh, problems in computer science. So what are some various engineering challenges? I should have asked you before I just revealed all the answers on the slide, but you know, the results gotta be fast. If you, you don't wanna sit there waiting for a minute or two to get the search to you. And also that's not really great performance wise, which means they're using more computing power, which means you're paying more money for an inferior experience. Um, but how do we store data efficiently? We talked about that earlier and how do we search efficiently? We probably wanna compress the data. And how do we keep our database updated? 
How do we keep up with current news? When COVID happened, how was Google able to kind of search all the web for all this new COVID-19 news and have that indexed in their search for people to start looking up? Uh, and also, how do we handle thousands of requests a second? So you need servers deployed across the world because you never know what kind of volume you're going to get in at any given moment. So these are all really engineering, interesting engineering challenges. And if you further your career as a software developer, product manager, or working in the field of tech, you're going to encounter variations of these challenges even if you don't work on search. Uh, in search, they're just all kind of amplified because they're all right there at the forefront. So this is a quick little aside, but I really wanted to mention this because I think it's important that people also think of the other of the other than search. So we have to make making search more accessible, as the slide says. So you know, not everyone can type on the keyboard. So how can we offer this amazing search experience that all of us use every day to folks who either can't type on the keyboard, who are hearing impaired, sight impaired, all the range of spectrum of you know folks can come in. So uh, the slides offer some really cool examples. And then one example I really want to mention is respecting the uniqueness of a user's language. So oftentimes, you know, communities in America and around the world, they might have their own unique vocabulary, whether that's slang, whether that's like common words or different usage of words. Um, I'm Cuban. So if you are Spanish or you are any ethnicity or you speak two languages, you might know that there's a bunch of different versions of Spanish. And if I was designing a Spanish search engine, I need to respect all the myriad of ways that different Spanish communities talk. And this is part of making search more accessible. And you should think about these things no matter what field you enter into, is how do you make your product more accessible to users and how the different variant inputs uh, that you can encounter when they use your product. And it's just especially harder with search because you communicate search with natural language. Um, and the last one I want to highlight, especially in this age, um, we never want to link things that can harm people. You know, if someone searches up vaccine information, we want to make sure we link them to relevant proven sources of vaccine information so they can, you know, if they want to learn more about vaccines, if they feel unsafe, then we can link them to the CDC so they, the CDC has amazing resources to help educate others. So this is something, unless, you know, sometimes journalists, you, they want to go look up misinformation. So we do want to still provide that capability. And that's a big ethical question um, and a big ethics in tech that, you know, I think more computer scientists should really have this conversation about. So. We're going to dive quickly into specialized search engines just so I can rapid fire some examples. Uh, oftentimes, you only think of Google and Bing and other and Yahoo. Like you probably only use Google. But how about some other search engines, You know, some uh, less common ones? So Linksy is a really cool one. Uh, it searches in news outlets. So I think you can just go to golinksy.com, type in your query, and it's going to search news outlets. And that's obviously really beneficial if you're a journalist um, or if you're someone who wants to keep up to date with the news. Speaking of news, uh, split search. This was actually recently showcased on Hacker News. Um, so if you if you have, if you're a tech person, Hacker News is a really fun site that it's kind of like Reddit, but it's much more niche and more focused on tech. Um, so giving a quick introduction to Hacker News, there some people are like, oh my god, this dude's introducing Hacker News. But anyway, split search. Uh, you enter in some sort of partisan political term, and then it indexes both like news sites for that media for that particular bias. Wolfram Alpha, I'm sure many of you use Wolfram Alpha to probably cheat on your math assignments. Um, it can do a lot. It's not just a big fancy calculator. Um, Wolfram Alpha is an entire knowledge base. Uh, and I included it here as an example, just because Wolfram Alpha, you can do, um, let's actually show this off. I thought this was really cool. I hope this still works. If not, this is embarrassing. So population of New Zealand. Let's see, population in New Zealand divided by 100. So you can just do natural language stuff like that over from Alpha. And you might not think of this as a search engine, like a search engine, but it's an entire curated knowledge base of like information. Uh, and Wolfram Alpha is a bunch of cool stuff. There's a lot of neat stuff that it can do um, that a lot of folks don't know about it. So definitely give it a try after this and check out what they do. They have entire areas you can check out. So I really wanted to give them a shout out because I feel like people only use it for their step-by-step -step math solutions, but there's a lot more it can do. Uh, and it was really early to achieve that level of precise. Like I'm pretty sure if I type that in to, let's actually test it out. If I type this into Google, 
But no, Google can't even display that result to me, but Google can do really complicated things. Like if I just type in population in New Zealand, Google can give me the answer, um, but it can't go a step further to do it divided by 100. So that's just the really interesting things that other search engines can offer. So um, let's see, hope I don't lose my slide. Cool. So another one uh, is Musical. Uh, I was trying to find search engines and I found this one and I just thought it'd be interesting to give it a shout out. I think it hasn't been touched since 2011, uh, so I don't recommend using it, but just wanted to show other ways of search engines. Um, Ecosia is a really cool one. It displays ads just like any other search engine and then it uses that ad revenue and donates them to nonprofits and charities um, that help plant trees in vulnerable areas of the world. Uh, it's actually powered by Bing so Ecosia, they just made like the interface and then they get the results from Bing and that's the results that are displaying. And I'll, you, we could talk about DuckDuckGo. I didn't actually list DuckDuckGo here, which is a privacy focused search engine. It does the same thing. Um, I think its results are powered by like Bing and Google. Um, but yeah, before we continue, we still got a lot more to cover, about 30 minutes, 30-ish minutes worth more material. I wanna just take some time for questions. Also a time for me to drink more water because I talk a lot. Um, and just for people to chime in with any comments or conversation real quick. And I'll be reading them out loud for those folks who are watching the recording, they know what's happening. If a lot of this seems obvious to you, and if you're watching like, I know all this stuff, that's really awesome. But a lot of people, when I speak to them, especially in CS, ask them about search, they often don't think of all these big questions behind search and all the engineering that goes into it. How large, so someone asked, how large would you say the database for these search engines are averagely? Um, I don't think that information is shared. I definitely tried to find that information and I couldn't easily find it. Uh, maybe we could search it after this during the demo. Um, but I would say it's, it's pretty ginormous. Um, we're going to, so we're, later in the talk, we're going to talk about implementation details for like a database for search engines. Um, and if whenever you do like software engineering interviews, I'm assuming you're a software engineer uh, or a programmer, so you might not be, but you are often asked system design questions. Um, and like this, I, designing Google could be a system design question. So you would need to not only, it's not just how large is the database, how do you make the database fault tolerant? How do you make the database, if one goes down, how do you keep relevant copies of the database? Because with Google, it's probably so huge. How do they keep uh, extra copies on hand? But yeah, th that information on how large a database is um, for these search engines, I don't think is publicly available. You can try, you could build a crawler and just start measuring how big yours is. Uh, and then you could take average estimates of the web and like multiply it by that number. That would actually be a really interesting uh, test. Cool. How does SEO work with respect with respect to search engines? So how does SEO, so S, I'm gonna rephrase your question and it, it expand the abbreviation. So how does search engine optimization work in respect with search engine? So I actually don't talk about search engine optimization in this talk. That's often a field for people actually creating the websites. Um, different search engines, which that being mainly Bing, Google, and Yahoo, and I think Yandex technically too, I, I think that's like a Russian search engine. They all have different guidelines for SEO. Uh, I feel like Google really sets the guidelines for SEO because they have the most market share. But SEO, um, it used to be like the amount of links was a pretty big like page ranking. There's also things like metadata, like what does your head of your HTML said? Uh, is your website accessible? So there's a series of web accessibility guidelines and Google will actually measure if your website doesn't meet these web accessibility guidelines, your website is actually like ranked less. Um, also uh, keywords, I think they don't really focus on keywords anymore. Um, there's actually, remind me to add a link to the in, the, um, in the GitHub. There's a really interesting article on Google's part about Google Hummingbird, which was their improvement to SEO. Um, so Dylan asked, what made you get into search engines? Um, I don't know. <laughs> I really like uh, just messing around with search. So there's a lot of interesting things you can use for search filters and finding information. Uh, I was really into libraries as a kid. 
I do say library is funny. Uh, my, my girlfriend does make fun of me for the way I pronounce it. She likes it's library, but no, it's library. Um, but I really enjoyed libraries as a kid. I enjoyed trying to hunt down rare books. And I think search engines are just the digital equivalent of that uh, on a much larger scale, obviously. And it's also just a really interesting engineering challenge because it incorporates so much of various fields of yes. Um, and I'm, and I, I like AI, so search engines tie in pretty nicely with AI. So we're going to move forward. I assume there's no other questions. I'm going to take a quick swig. Cool. So we're going to, we talked earlier about the three ingredients for a search engine. We need, I, I even forgot, we need a web crawler, we need a database, and we need a search bar. So these slides are going to be really quick, just demonstration of what you need. We're not going to be implementing some of this stuff. Our code is actually going to implement an inverted index. Um, but for this stuff, I just want to give some pointers to anybody who wants to go out and try making their own search engine from scratch. Definitely really fun, definitely a really hard challenge, but a great resume item. So probably a good next hackathon project. But implementing a web crawler, if you're prototyping, you want to do Python and Beautiful Soup. Beautiful Soup is just a library for scraping web pages and it automates a lot of the process for you. You can use any language you're comfortable with. I'm just recommending these two because I think iteration time is really quick. And when you're learning, that's really important. And there's already a lot of resources on those two languages specifically. <clears throat> if for some reason you're ever bringing the search engine to production, you would want to use a really fast language and a language that's really close to the metal. So Rust, C++, Go, anything that lets you multi-thread it has concurrency or parallel, parallel support, parallelism support, I can't speak, built in um, that can help you improve your crawling speed and how quick your performance is. And this last thing I want to say is when you're scraping websites, make sure you respect the robots.txt. If you don't know what that is, let's go ahead and show you. So does someone want to give me an example website so I can show you what a robots.txt is? Google. Google does actually have one. Um, let's actually, we're going to do Google.com. I actually went to it earlier today. So robots.txt is, is oftentimes it's not this big, but it's this little text file that just tells web crawlers what to respect and what areas not to go in when scraping for data. Uh, because some websites might be maintained by you know, small groups of people, or they might not have the budget to have a lot of traffic. And web crawlers are a form of traffic. Like they are just as valid traffic as like you going to a website on your laptop. And you can DDoS a website accidentally <laughs> if you send a bunch of web crawlers to a site. Um, and Google, as you know, probably has millions of web crawlers. So things like robots.txt just say, hey, don't go here, don't grab this, don't scrape the website. So just make sure you respect them. You can look up exactly what this stuff means. We can actually try Hoppin. Hoppin has a robots.txt, I don't know. So you just add robots.txt to the end of any website. Um, Hoppin doesn't have a, that's a really boring one. Uh, it should just tell you what it is. So you can actually play Discord. I did Discord earlier today. So, boom. Yeah. And if anybody used to use old online forms at like the beginning, like late, late 2010s, mid early 2010s, uh, most online forms had an active robots at the bottom of it. And you would often see Google, like when it was scraping your website. And then you could see Google entering your website and then you leave it and then you search for something from your website and then it would appear there. Um, like something new from your website. That's a really little side fun fact. I used to be on a Halo forum back during the early 2010s and we used to see, oh, Google's on our site right now. It's indexing our, our form. So uh, there are ways to actually see when the robot is on your site. So let's jump right back. So um, what database slash index do you use? Obviously use an inverted index, but how that index is appears in the database is going to differ from database to database. Um, when I was doing research on this top topic of uh, two commons was Postgres and MariaDB slash MySQL. They were the common implementations for, hey, if you want to implement a search engine, use this. Most people don't really talk about implementing search engines. Either they use a very specialized database, like Google's not going to open source the database they use, um, or maybe they do and I never saw it. But also, it's a very highly specific area of research, and a lot of database research goes into having really fast database search engines. 
to really fast indexes? How do we make read write speeds really fast? How would you make them happen on multiple threads? Um, so multiple computers can read and write data at the same time. So these are just some quick pointers. Um, oftentimes people don't talk about it because not many people make their own search engines. So you can either use one of these or you can just hard code it in code. I wouldn't recommend that. Uh, Neo4j, so Neo4j is a graph database. I wanted to give it a shout out because I've used Neo4j before. I think it's really cool. Uh, it's not really a common recommendation, but if you're building what's called an ontology, so I'm going to spell that word out, ontology, or a knowledge base, which is just, let's see if we can get a good photo of ontology here. So an ontology is just looks like this. It's just a bunch of knowledge connected to with these little lines and these nodes. So if you study CS for long enough, you'll get into graph data structures. Um, Neo4j is really popular for that. If you don't know what that is, that's perfectly okay. I can happy, happy to answer those questions at the end there. So I just want to give it a shout out for the more advanced practitioners watching this talk. So even if you're not an advanced practitioner, my first internship used Neo4j. So you're never too early to start using this kind of stuff. And my first internship was just after my first data structures and algorithms class. So, all right. So we have our database. We, we, so we've made two things so far with these slides. We have our web, web crawlers. Our web crawlers are adding things to our database. And now we have a database with the information in it. How do we access it? We need an API. Uh, API stands for application programming interface. And oftentimes, uh, does anyone here not know what an API is? I want to quickly ask that. I'm going to explain it anyways. but. If anyone here doesn't know what an API is, I want to quickly give a more detailed explanation. If I hear silence, I'm going to assume everyone does. But very briefly, an API is just a piece of code that accepts network requests. And whenever a network request comes in, it returns information back. So yeah, very simple. Um, chances are you've a lot of you have written an API before, or you're writing one for this hackathon. So uh, you can create an API in any language you want. Just make sure that it can connect to the database either through drivers, which is just a type of library, or a framework for connecting with that database. Uh, and then creating your search bar. Search, this is really easy. Search bars can live literally anywhere. They can be on the web. They can be on mobile. You can use React. You can use Vue. You can use Angular, Swift. I can name a million frameworks. Uh, I think some people won't like that for desktop. I mentioned Electron. Uh, Electron is a way to write JavaScript web apps as a desktop app, and it's really cool. You should definitely check it out, especially if you're trying to start like a side hustle or something or a business and you want a desktop app. Electron's a really cool answer to that. Or you can use native um, bindings for GUI. Like uh, there's some for Linux that I don't remember the name of, but there's a bunch of different ways you can create your client interface or your user interface. It doesn't just have to be a web technology. So. We talked everything about search engines. Uh, and you like you noticed that I didn't have a lot of examples to pick from. And you might have noticed during when I said Ecosia uses Bing or something along those lines. Uh, most companies don't build their own search engine. It's a big engineering challenge. It's not fun. So what they do is they often kind of just rent out an API. So Google and Bing both offer search engine APIs. Uh, and there's some other services that also offer APIs. So with Google, oh, let me actually exit this slide real quick. And there's some open source solutions we'll get into. So Google, let's see if we can follow this link. They have an API you can use um, that lets you add it to your website and then you can customize the functionality and everything. So Bing also has one. I've used the Bing API before. It's really good. I highly recommend using it for one of your future hackathon projects, especially if Microsoft is sponsoring the event. I know I'm going to work for Microsoft, so I have a huge bias. But the Bing API works really well and it's simple to use. Uh, I can't speak for the Google API because I've never used it before. Um, but yeah, there's often APIs are provided for you so, you so you don't have to write your own search engine from scratch. Uh, and if you don't want to use the APIs, you want something that's a little bit more customizable, but you don't want to make your own search engine, a lot of places offer, I don't know, places, there's a lot of open source solutions. So Meli Search is a really cool one. It's written in Rust, it has a lot of nice features built in. Um, another popular solution is something called Apache Solar, which is maintained by the Apache uh, Foundation, another search engine written in Java, as it says. Uh, and I think the, one of the most popular industry solutions that's used by Netflix, a lot of cloud providers have it, is Elasticsearch. I've never used Elasticsearch personally. I've only used the top one, Melly Search, before, uh, and I really liked it. It was really easy to set up. So 
if this is something you do want to implement but you don't want to implement a search engine, here's how to add search engine functionality without going through all the trouble of implementing one. So we're here, we're nearing the end here. So don't worry, we're going to get into code in a second if that's where you want to go. But I just want to tell you where you can go next after you've done all this research, you've studied the search engines, uh, you like it, you're still stuck around for the end of the talk and you're like, Anthony, I want to go learn more. Uh, that's really exciting. I'm glad I got you excited about search engines. Maybe you were before, but there's a lot of things you can do. Um, I really recommend that you try to implement one yourself. It's a really fun challenge and it will push the knowledge of everything you've been taught about CS. Uh, and it's just a really cool resume item and project. Um, if you want to learn more specific about like, there's a lot of stuff I didn't talk about. So the entire areas of semantic search and I'll actually go, uh, let's say it, I'll just go here. So the entire areas of search I didn't talk about, you can see this giant topics list. Um, a lot of these are AI and machine learning related. So if you want to dive deeper into one of those specific niches and how that it can improve search, please do. Uh, natural language processing is in a fascinating field. So I'm also with AI at UCF. I don't think I've mentioned that at the beginning of the talk, but I am with AI at UCF. So that's why I like AI. Uh, I'm with the club. But there's a bunch of stuff with search engines that goes far beyond the stuff I talked about in this. Um, so. Yeah, and also in the workshop slides, I uh, in the workshop repo, I provided some exercises. So if you're like, I want to go more, but I don't know what to do, I gave some exercises for y'all to do, for y'all to implement. So yeah, I'm going to go ahead. I believe the link to the workshops is already dropped. So I'm going to repaste the link. I don't know if it was pinned. Let me paste the link in the chat here. And now this is time for questions. If you have any questions, please throw them my way. Hopefully I talked a lot and I answered a lot of questions. Where can we find this recording? Uh, the recordings will be posted on YouTube after the event is over. So they will not be available immediately. Um, Night Hacks will be posted on the Night Hacks YouTube channel. And I believe if you go to the Ask Organizer chat in the Discord server, they can point you to the YouTube channel. Yes. I can share the slides in the Discord. Um, let me actually share them right now. I forgot to link them. I'm so sorry. I was working on the slides until like last minute. Last night, um, I, I was supposed to do them last night, but I played a lot of Oblivion last night. Uh, if anyone's ever played Elder Scrolls Oblivion. Good game. So I say this as an organizer who enters the session that I finished the slides last minute, uh, but I was practicing them. I was doing practice runs several times throughout the week. But uh, there's a link to the slides. So, yep. Any other questions anyone has? If not, I'm going to jump into the code. So if you're not out of the woods yet, presentation is not yet over, but the code example is really short. So cool. I don't see any more questions. Uh, if you have any questions, go ahead and write them in the chat. So is creating an API yourself difficult? No, actually, I can even provide you some sample code. So um, I mentioned at the beginning that I actually did a search engine with Dylan. Dylan's here watching the workshop, so his name is going to be plastered, so I'm okay with saying his name. So sorry, Dylan, for calling you out. We actually did a search engine project for Shell Hacks. Um, and it's not that hard. So there is like example code. If you use Python, I think it's a lot easier. So all the code needed, actually, I gave a, a workshop on Docker earlier this week. So let me show that code because that code's a lot easier to read than the code I was about to show you. So this is an API right here. So this is how easy it is to set up an API. I even have it called search. <laughs> so when I was giving the Docker workshop for the AI club, I even used code from my old shell hacks uh, entry. Um, so you can just start off with here. It's in the same workshop as the search engine code. So it's the Docker line. So you implementing an AI API yourself is not at all difficult. Um, I think the, the hard, like nothing in computer science is inherently really difficult. There's always going to be frustrations and challenges. Um, but you can, you can do any of this and you can implement all of this. So even if you feel like you can't, you definitely can. So yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely headache inducing. Um, like, don't worry, you're going to get stuck, but getting stuck is part of the learning process. If you're not getting stuck, 
uh, then you are either just naturally breezing through things, but you should be okay with getting stuck. That is always a good thing. Um, so, and you don't have to solve everything either. Uh, a lot of people think that people are superstar coders, uh, but oftentimes like they get a stuck just as often as you. So, especially senior engineers, you'd be surprised the amount of times I've seen a senior engineer make a typo in their code and then didn't know what was wrong. The same exact mistake that you make in one of your intro to programming classes. So um, let's go ahead and actually search, uh, do our quick search engine code. So I'm going to quit. I'm going to explain everything here. I'm going to add additional comments and then I'm going to upload this to the repo. But if you have questions about the code as I show it, please let me know. This is for this, like, I love giving workshops and I have a lot of fun talking about search engines. Um, I'm not even getting paid to do this and I'm just donating an hour of my time to blabber about this topic. But this is also for you guys to learn too, you guys and gals and, and non-binary, also for you to learn too. So please, if you have any questions, type it in here. But let's go right into the code. So I'm not implementing a web crawler. Uh, believe it or not, I've only implemented a web crawler once and it wasn't search engine related. So I'm telling you to implement a search engine and I haven't even lived up to my own expectations. Um, it was a really fun time to implement a web crawler. But we're going to use initiate a dictionary. So we have our web crawler. It returns a Python dictionary. A Python dictionary is just like a hash table. I'm so sorry if you hear my keyboard. I have a loud mechanical keyboard. I'm going to move away from the mic. So hash table. So we have an example dict. So an example dictionary in Python, this is how you init a dict. That sounds really inappropriate. This is how you init a dictionary. I shouldn't say the abbreviations out loud. Um, this is how you create one in Python. It's these curly brackets. And then dictionaries are keys and values. And it doesn't have to be strings. It can be numbers. And the one on the left can be the strings. It can be, let's see. Floating point numbers, so two point two. It can be a myriad of things. So, two, one. so the thing about dictionaries, it's quite literally like an actual dictionary in everyday life. Like you open up the dictionary to your definition, uh, to your word, and then you get the definition. So if you want to think of it not just like as keys and values, but as a word and a definition, um, you can also look at it that way. So our web crawler is, is going to return a bunch of site URLs and it's going to return what's on the site. So we have our little web crawler here. Uh, and then we're going to create our inverted index. So if I go back to the slides, and we go back into the inverted index picture. We notice that the inverted index, so before the way it is right now, excuse me, let me close all these tabs. I shouldn't have this many tabs open. That thought doesn't look good. Um, I'll make this work. So <laughs> we have the way our index is before we invert it. We have the sites on the left and we have the words on the right. But the way where we're going to do it, the way we're going to invert it, is we're going to put the words on the left and the sites on the right. So the word cow will then link to, we see cow in site one and site two. So we're actually going to print our inverted index. Let me import something here to make it look pretty. error because I'm not importing paper correctly. So we'll just worry about that in a second. Um, but we have the way we're going to invert our index. So we're going to go through our dictionary. We want to get the website URL. And when you want to get the website content, and you can just call dot items and it returns a tuple. And a tuple in Python is just, you can think of a something from math, like an XY coordinates. coordinates. Tuple example is just it just comes in parentheses and it says, in our case, it's going to be the URL and what's on this. So it returns it in this nice little data structure uh, and then we can reference it the way we want. So we're going to go to the website. So we start off, we want the website URL and the content. We get site one and we go to the cows go moo. So we want to get the content. So, and then we're going to split it by word. So we can't just go through it the way it is. We need to split it by word. So 
Now it's going to be for word and content. I think this will be better if I call it sentence. It'll make more sense to people. So for word and sentence, if the word is not in our dictionary or inverted index, we want to create a new set. And then once we have that set created, or if it was already there to begin with, we're going to add this. Um, before I move forward, set. Does anyone know what a set is in Python? Yep, I'm going to explain it to you. So that's the whole point. So Dylan said a unique collection of values. So a set is in all respects almost identical to a list, uh, except for two things. I believe the set is sorted. I might be wrong on that, but someone correct me. A set is sorted, and a set only has exactly one copy of every element in it. So if you have the list, we can actually demonstrate. So if I just type in Python here in my terminal, and I have example list. And let's do one, two, 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 three, four, five, 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 uh, six. Okay. I have my example list. This is a, a REPL, which just lets you type Python real quickly as an example in the interpreter in the console. So if I print this, so what a set, when I, what's going to happen when I print set? is that it's just going to it's going to get rid of all duplicate values and it's just going to be 1 2 3 4 5 6 and that's exactly what we get back we get 1 2 3 4 5 6 so that is all a set is exactly like a list except that it makes it only keeps unique values and a set's really cool here um, because we get to save on memory so site 1 and 2 both have duplicate words so the appears in site 1 and 2 actually this would make more sense if it appears multiple times so the appears multiple times in site one. And so for word and sentence, we're going to go over the multiple times. Um, but we don't want to add site one multiple times once we already have it in our list. So if we already have it in our list, we can go back. So site one already appears. We don't want to add site one again. And the set lets us do that. So it lets us only once we add site one or once we add the URL, we don't add it again because we already know the word is associated with that URL. So it's just useful to have if the content of the website contains duplicate words. So you could think of like COVID-19, an article that mentions COVID-19 will say COVID-19 multiple times. So we don't want to index multiple of that and we're going to save on memory that way. So that's just a quick efficiency trick you can use. Um, so this is literally all that's happening. We create a new dictionary that's going to look like this in the end. And we just, I'm actually going to steal this. So I'm going to print out the dictionary for y'all. So that way you can see what it looks like. I'm just going to copy out how I'm printing here. And if you have any additional questions about the code that are not coming to you right now, please ask me in the Discord or whenever you want in the chat. So, so after we did that, now we're going to, we have our inverted index, and then we're going to search our index. So our search query can be whatever. Uh, does someone here want to give an example search query in the chat so I can go ahead and write it? What is pi? Obviously, this is no Google right here and 50 line Python code. So we'll see what's going to happen. So we're going to have our search query, what is pi? Uh, we're going to create another set for results. This P, this, so now that you know that we don't want the set to, we use the sets because we don't want duplicate values, can people answer why do we want a set for our search results? Yep, Dylan got it. We want a set for our search results because we don't want repeated documents as a result. So we only want to play, like we don't need to show the user you the same URL multiple times, unless it's like different like sub URLs, but we just want to show them Wikipedia once, for example. So we have our quick set of search results. 
Uh, we have this try catch here. So this is called try accept, but oftentimes in other languages, it's called try catch. Um, and I'll explain what this is in just a second. So don't worry about what this code is. Uh, it won't work without it because you'll get an error. And so we just don't want the error to break our code. So we have our results. Uh, the reason why we convert it to list is a very technical Python reason about hashable data types. Uh, I'm more than happy to, to do a deep dive afterwards, but I don't want to delve too deep into this example in particular. Um, so for our results in the search results, we just add it to our set. And we kind of go over every single word in here. So we're going to go every word in the search query, and we're going to try and look through each result. So we have a word. Our word gets from the exerted index. Bada bing, bada boom. One thing I got to mention, though, and I don't think I covered this, um, is so for people who aren't familiar with big O notation, and they're like, how, what is this? What are you doing right now when you do word and the brackets around inverted index? Um, because computer science loves to make things as fast as possible, hash tables are called hash tables because when a key value pair, you would normally hash the value on the left. You hash the key, which is just transforming it in such a way that it doesn't really represent like the data it is anymore. Uh, if it's hashing doesn't make sense to you or if that definition you know is wrong, don't worry about it. Hashing is something you should learn in your later data structures and algorithms class. And I will provide some resources in the readme for this doc on hash tables. I believe I did include one. Yep. I have a whole tutorial on hash tables if you want to learn more. I didn't make it. Someone else did. But if you want to learn more after this talk. And they're really cool for interviews. So hash tables are a great data structure for your leak code interviews. So the reason why we use a dictionary and a hash table is because it lets us search things really quick than using an array or a list. Um, so if I do, this will make more sense. Like if I do go back to this, if I look through the word and the word is cow, rather than going through every single one, it's when I look up the word cow on in my inverted index. So if we use the syntax right here, inverted index brackets, word and closing brackets, it's not going to look through every single thing. It's not going to go, oh, OK, that's not cow. Uh, says, that's not cow. Oh, I found cow. There it is. It's just going to jump straight to cow. It's going to have an instant hit. Uh, o of one lookup value. I didn't mention that earlier. Uh, and that just has to do with how things are stored in memory. Uh, it's really cool stuff. So if you do want to learn more about it, I do encourage you. So let's see here. Cool. Just making sure that I'm still not going over time. So I want to make sure I'm all good there. So we are kind of reaching the end of everything here. So I'm just going to quickly run this example code. Um, we go through here. We try catch our results. The reason why I have a key error uh, is because in Python in a dictionary, if you try to reference something that doesn't exist, it throws an error. It panics. Um, so we just do this so we don't get any errors. And you'll see the errors pop up now. So let's exit out of here. So we're going to go quickly. We're going to finish this off by running some code. I do example.py. So this is our inverted index. You can see the site one. And then it's also a lowercase the on site one and two. Cow site one and two. So this is the inverted index we created. Uh, and it's the error what is not our index. And the error pi is not in our index. But the error but is, is that's terrible to say. So site four night hacks is awesome. So what is pi return site four night hacks is awesome. Um, and this is very similar to how Google still kind of works. Google actually, obviously, like you've learned already, is much more complicated than an inverted index. But if I go over here, you can notice uh, Google highlights the words in bold on the, word, the relevant search results that it found. And that is an inverted index, essentially. It's more complicated, but that's the general gist. And that is the workshop that kind of concludes everything. So big brief overview of search engines. I hope you learned something and then some code on creating an inverted index in case you wanted to start making a search engine yourself, which I hope you do. Uh, and if you do, send it over to me. I would love to see it. I was going to demo the workshop, the search engine my friends and I made back at Shell Hacks the two weeks ago, uh, but it broke. And I didn't feel like redeploying all the APIs. <laughs> uh, so it no longer, the site no longer works. Yep, you all are free to leave. We're stopping here, but I'll stick around a few more minutes for questions or anything or any extra comments.